sentences. Locus is a co-working places, or usually foreigners are using it, but also other people. Uh, if you are an individual entrepreneur, you, you would like to use these premises, not to sit at home. If you would like to join another people, share ideas, so this is exactly the place for you when you can meet people, discuss, help each other with the business, share ideas. So feel free to join Locus. You, you can visit us for one free day, or you can pay a membership as you like. We will organize a, a lot of training courses here, so you are welcome anytime. As I mentioned already, if you want a Coke or water, tea, whatever, just help yourself on the table. And if you need a toilet, it's, so if you go out from the doors, it's on the right side. No, that's all for my Thank you for introducing himself. Okay. Uh, thank you for having So, uh, my name is Eddie David. I'm going to do this lecture about basically bootstrapping. It's the second time today that I'm doing this lecture. I, uh, I had it on a webinar to an accelerator in Yerevan in Armenia. So, it's kind of funny for me. It's like the first time I'm doing the same lecture on the same day. Uh, so we're going to talk basically about bootstrapping your startup and I think I have a little bit of the screen where no? Jana, you know how to play with the projector so because it slices a little bit yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh okay, yeah, right, 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 right. no, oh, doesn't, no, doesn't help so maybe we can push it a little bit. I don't think Like it seems as if it's cutting on the. Yeah, it seems like it's cutting on the. Yeah. Anyway, the, I left the really boring parts uh, below. So, <laughs> uh, so I basically uh, co founded. Yeah, I think something's wrong with the projector. But uh, yeah, let's just leave it like this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, um, bootstrapping your business and basically the idea over here is how to um, start a startup with no investors. So this is what the, the, the lecture is focused on. If you can help me out with a little bit of information, are there a lot of investors in, here in Prague? Is it easy to get investment for a startup or it's kind of difficult? Do you know of people, a lot of people who raise investment? Like for a startup? I, I think I, from what I know it's not that easy. It's kind of easy in the States, uh, but in places like Prague and other places you're pretty much on your own. In the States also, everyone says that everyone is getting investors, but if you're going to look at the statistics, the, the statistics are that, that you're not going to get an investor, even if you're in the States. So, I wouldn't count on it, and that means that you have to somehow fund your startup on your own. And that's what we're going to talk about in, in this lecture. Uh, yeah, so I'll do a, a short intro, intro about, in, about myself. So basically, I'm, I'm a sort of a di digital nomad. In the last four, more than four years now, I've been traveling and working at the same time. Basically, I'm changing locations every two months. Yeah. So I live in 25 countries so far in this uh, nomadic way. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about this. Then later we're going to talk about bootstrapping methods. How do you bootstrap a startup? And then uh, I'm going to give a few examples from my own businesses, what worked out for me, and so on. Okay, so uh, a few words about what, what I was before I started traveling. Uh, so I have to say I was pretty normal before. Um, I was working in KPMG in BDO, I was an accountant, the regular story. And uh, four years ago I decided that I want to see the world while, while uh, working in the same time. I think this is one of the advantages of having a startup, basically the freedom that it allows you. And uh, then I started traveling and going from, from one place to another. 
Uh, and I'll show you just a map of how basically it looks like. So that's a really weird map, but basically that's what I've done in the last uh, four years, including South America. So uh, I just go from one place to another, change every two months. And uh, the startups are really cool because startups allow you to do them wherever you want, basically. And I know that there are a lot of expats here that are doing their startup as well. So if you're taking this path, you can pretty much take it from wherever you want. And I'll go back to the slide before. Yeah, so um, I have a blog called becomenoma.com that explains on how to be constantly traveling. Uh, what I'm basically doing, and Yana talked about this, is co-working uh, wherever I go. Because for me, the separation from home is very, very important. And I recommend you check it out, on, at least on the efficiency. It would be interesting as an experiment to see how more efficient you are not working from home. If you're going to do your startup, you're probably going to work from home. And you're going to see that one of the, maybe the saddest elements of... of um, of having a startup is the loneliness. You're kind of on your own the minute you're starting. And this is this is getting a lot of us when, when you start a startup. And that's up to you to get the right co-founder, the right the right partner, and find the, the environment of work that is best for you. Because this is really a struggle. This is something that is not easy to, to digest. And so there is a saying over here that is a little bit cut in the presentation that is basically uh, what I noticed is that constant traveling and, uh, and founding a startup are basically both very uncertain. So if you, even if you don't uh, feel like becoming a digital nomad, uh, the best way of increasing the uncertainty levels in your life is having your own startup because it's, it's really a roller coaster of emotions. And uh, by the way, I recommend to people who want to have their own startup uh, to think a little bit if they're ready for the ups and downs. Because one of the things you're going to notice is that there are a lot of ups and downs during this road of building your startup. You're going to have a few go good moments during the day and then a lot of bad moments in the beginning during the day. So uh, emotionally, I would say that one of the elements that you want to check about yourself is if you can actually handle the ups and downs. And if you're a person that is taking the downs a little bit more, let's say you're very emotional about the downside, maybe startups are not from you. Because then it's going to be a manic depressive, uh, depressive uh, experience that I'm not sure you want to have. So a lot, what I notice is that when you start your startup, a lot of it is just not feeling too good when things are going amazing and not feeling too bad when things are going wrong. So this is just a little bit of the emotional side. Um, so let's switch to, uh, um, to what basically I'm, I'm doing. So basically I, I, I think this is a really nice example because I did a, a nice variety of lots of things that, uh, that allow me to talk about let's say an entire circle of things. So uh, my experience are basically, the first, the first experience is freelancing. I've done a lot of freelancing. I prepared business plans for clients for the last four years. And this is on the array of service providing. And uh, this one is important to say. Basically, uh, I love this one. Wow, this is great. Getting better, a little bit. Okay, so we're good on the side now. So, Only not on the one below, but we'll be fine. Uh, so basically, the freelancing side is really um, a lot of people are saying, "Wow, start, if I'm doing a startup, I shouldn't be freelancing because freelancing basically is a cash flow operation, right?" And it's kind of uh, a lot of us are saying freelancing is not really entrepreneurship. But for me, freelancing is, has a lot to do with entrepreneurship. It's really an interesting experiment, and more than anything, it's the only thing that's going to bring you money from day one as a cash flow operation, which is very, very important. So I wouldn't rule out the possibility of freelancing. A little bit about what I've done. I, I've been freelancing for three years. I stopped freelancing in the last year since my startups are basically taking over all the time that I've got. But uh, this is a good option, we're going to talk a little bit about that. My second business is Lingolearn.com. It's an online business. It's an online language school. And basically, Lingolearn.com is teaching 16 languages. And uh, 
the nice thing about it, and I'm going to talk about it soon, is that basically we managed to sell from the first month, which is pretty cool. And now it's kind of a nice operation. We have about 20 teachers, and about the latest figures is about $25,000 on rev revenue monthly. So it's kind of a nice lifestyle business that is working out slowly, and I learned a lot from it. And then the last thing is startuplink.com. Startuplink.com is basically a startup that is trying to um, map the entire startup ecosystem. And by the way, one request from you is that basically if you have a startup, if you can list it on the map or try startuplink.com. Uh, now, why did, I, why did I put the three of them? Because each one of them is a different branch of something that you might be doing. And it's really important to understand uh, what are you doing? Because based on that, you're going to know if you're going to bootstrap or not. I'm just going to give a, a quick story. If you're doing service, uh, if you're supplying service for others, you don't need investors. There is no reason. You can have a nice agency or, or a nice business and you don't really need investors. For Lingolearn.com, we managed to create this site that now generates about $25,000 of revenue after four and a half years. It took us a very long time without investors as well. A bit, if you're building your own lingolearn.com, whatever it is, and we're going to talk about what is it, then you're not necessarily in need for investors. The last one is startuplink.com. Startuplink.com is very, very technological. And if you're building something that looks like startuplink.com, that is very technological, very far away from revenue, then 100% you're going to need investors. So basically, whatever you're building, you're going to have to realize what is it. And I forgot to ask, tell you, if you want to have any questions, feel free. Oh, yeah. Okay. That figures, 25,000, yeah. it's a year or monthly? Monthly. Monthly. If it was per, per year, I would be still freelancing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's not profit, it's revenue. The yeah. profit is like... $100 or something. No, it's a little bit more, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, basically it's like a, 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 um, a business with very low margins because I pay teachers and I do marketing. I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about it. But it's a nice example about how you can start from nothing and after four and a half years actually have something that generates a lot of money monthly, which is pretty cool. Uh, and without investors, and this is the most important thing. Um, so, for you, again, the idea is try to understand whatever your startup idea is, which one of the categories is, is your startup idea, and based on that, you're going to know more or less if you're going to need investors or not. Uh, a little bit about bootstrapping. So bootstrapping, I understand, it's also a coding language, and that's why people were a little bit afraid of this lecture. Uh, so bootstrapping actually means it, it comes from what you, don't, what you don't see here is a shoe, that people are bootstrapping a shoe. And basically the idea is how to maintain a startup without a lot of money. So needless to say, if you want to maintain a startup without a lot of money, you have to do two things. Basically, you have to fund it from various channels. This is the revenue, so it, or some kind of a form of money. Either your own money, revenues from clients, crowdfunding, grants. So this is the first element, the revenue, or how do you spend, which money do you spend? And the second element of bootstrapping is decreasing expenses to minimum, which is also super important. And the big bonus in bootstrapping is that basically you have 100% of the business, which is great. Not only because you have a lot of the business and you're like, you have a lot more. When you have someone who partner with you, it's a problem, and we're going to talk about a little bit about it. I, I don't care about giving my equity that much. What I care about is basically someone that is now a partner, and this is an issue. Even if they have 1%, they have a little bit of a stake in the company, and then you're not that free like you used to be before. I'm going to talk a little bit about it later, the disadvantages of investors. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about, about companies that actually managed to do it. So basically, um, GitHub, MailChimp, 37 Signals, TechCrunch, all of them, uh, all of them bootstrap. They started with no investors. And this one is really nice to, to see that you have a lot of examples of, of businesses that made it big. All those guys raised money after. So when they wanted to scale and become really big, that's the point where they actually said, okay, now it makes sense to raise money. And uh, uh, the idea over here is that you raise money on your own terms and not 
when you're in need, when you're in need. When you, when you try to get something and you, and you know, you, you kind of signal that you have a really big problem and you need something, it's very likely that nobody's want to join you. Nobody want to wanna join you. Usually investors join you when you have some kind of a position of power. And those guys actually did it. They were so successful that investors came to them and told them, hey, I really, and then the term sheet doesn't look so bad and the conditions are not that crazy. So basically, if you can manage to get to a certain point on your own, it's a lot better on investors. And uh, other than those that we all know, or we know some of them, there are many uh, more startups that never raised money, conquer the niche, and generate great income for their owners. And you will never know about those, but they exist by the thousands all over the place. And nice income is whatever nice income means for you. So some of them are making $5,000 a month, some of them are making on profits $10,000 a month, and so on and so on. You won't hear about those guys. It's a very specific niche. And that might be exactly the thing that you want to do. Like have this nice revenue, nobody is driving you crazy, nobody knows about you, and really cool lifestyle. So that's another thing. Okay, so uh, now let's, let's do a little bit of a test of uh, if bootstrapping is for you. And again, this, those questions will indicate if you're going to have to spend most of your time in getting investors, or you can actually spend most of your time doing the thing you like the most, which is working on your business. So the first question is, is it a cash flow oper oper operation targeting a specific niche or a startup that will change the world? So basically, this, the, the thing is as following. If you're trying to change the world, create something really, really big, and by the way, Startup Link is a little bit like this because we're trying to map the entire startup ecosystem and bring all the startups into one place, this is something that you don't want to start on your own. You need investors to back you up. If your vision is to be a multi-million company, do not do it on your own. You're probably not going to go that far because you're going to monetize in a very late stage. Uh, but then again, if you have a very clear idea about what is the cash flow operating the operation that you build, and it's a very specific niche, for example, email marketing for photographers, you know, that's a really nice bootstrapping business that, that you know you can arm in, in not so long lot of time. By the way, investors won't be interested in this because this is a specific niche and they won't see the, the big amount of money. So if you're going for a niche, you can do it on your own one and two. It's not worthwhile talking to investors because the smaller the niche is, the less chance investors are going to be interested in actually conquering the world with you because they're not going to conquer the world. Um, because of the size of the market or what? Exactly, yeah. So if you're going on a very, very specific niche that you know that will allow you to get about $50,000 a month of revenue, no investor will come and say, whoa, I'm joining you, it's $50,000 a month. Investors are taking a lot of risk. And they're doing that for the small chance that if they're going to make it and the startup is going to survive, it's going to bring them a lot of money. What about if it is a very high uh, margin niche? That's a problem again because this, if you have very small revenue and $50,000 a month is kind of small revenue, they know that it's going to disappear within the startup on the salaries and so on and so on. That's why they're not looking for those things that they have to fight with you with, hey, can you take only 40 and give me that? It's, it's not really going to those directions. So investors are very interested in the, in the businesses that have the potential. Investors are making their money by selling the business. So they don't, they're not really interested in those really cool businesses that make $50,000, but if that's the end stop and that's the size of the market, not really for them. Most of them, at least. Those who know what they're doing. Maybe the friends and family will, will invest, but the others will probably not. Uh, is there a clear monetization plan? So basically, if you know how you're going to make money and you're very sure about how you're going to make money, then yeah, that's great. And then you might not need investors, but if you're not sure, for example, LingoLearn, when we started, we knew that we're selling packages of online lessons to students. It was very, very clear. So we didn't need investors. But on Startup Link, we still don't know one year after how do we make money. So basically, if you're not 100% sure about how to make money, probably investor is the thing. If you know how to make money, you might try to bootstrap. Yeah? Yeah, just to ask if uh, the presentation will be available later, or yeah. you need to copy the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
We, we're going to even try to send it without, uh, without cutting in the end, yeah. And it will be, it will be. Uh, so this is the monetization thing. Uh, one of the biggest questions you want to do on bootstrapping, if you're going to bootstrap our investors, is can you start selling now? So by definition, you're never going to be ready. Yeah, your, your product, especially in the beginning, is never perfect. But if I'm telling you, look, you're going to have to start selling in 20 days. I don't care what. It can be only 10% of your, of your product or something. If you're going to tell me, whoa, you're crazy. I'm not selling anything in 20 days. There is no way, like I do in Startup Link. If you're going to ask me, I'm going to tell you, no way I'm going to do it. So you might need investors. If you know that you can start selling from day one, like we did on LingoLearn, which is basically putting an, a landing page, starting to pay a little bit to Google, getting some traffic, calling the traffic and persuading them to buy packages of, of English, and we knew that we can do it after one week, then you're more in a position of not needing investors. So those are important questions that, again, allow you to understand, do you have to put a lot of time, and time now in getting investors? How much R&D expense is required? How far are you from the product? Or how far are you from the market? If you're very far, again, investors. This one is very, very important. Has demand been validated? And uh, you know, the biggest uh, risk for a startup or the biggest uh, death factor of a startup is basically that you're gonna build something that nobody needs. You know that already. People keep on telling us that and everyone still Managers to is going to meet you. That's my biggest favorite startup link, by the way. So basically, this is why startups die. You invest a lot, a lot of time, and basically, people are telling you, "Well, that's pretty cool, but uh, not really for me, or no way I'm paying for that." And that's what what happens to most startups. So basically, Lingolearn, for example, we <laughs> saw another company that was making money, doing exactly what we're doing, only in a different market. And then you tell yourself, okay, I don't need to validate the market. There is a validation. Like the, the, there is a validation that people are willing to pay for the product. And if you don't have this validation, then you're probably going to be a little bit more far away from the money, and then you need the investors. And one more question. Do you have the skills uh, to do more of, more, most of the work yourself? So, for example, if your startup is very technological and you need to code, and uh, none of you on the team is a coder, needless to say that your expenses are going to be a lot higher than what they would be if you would code your entire business. And then, in that scenario, uh, you're going to need an investor. So those are all important questions to ask. And, uh, uh, and it's really important to say that sometimes investors are a must. You can't avoid it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In the previous one, um, another point would be how much time do you have, right? Because if I don't care working weekends for two years, then I can, it can take me longer without investors. How much time and how much money? Yeah. yeah. You also, if you have tons of money, that, if you have tons of money, you don't need an investor. Although you're putting your money, money your sweat yeah. equity. If, if, you're, if you're able to do your, the, 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 the whole startup yourself, yeah. and you don't mind that it's going to take you two years because you have all the income in the side and you're happy doing it. I agree. The question of how much time you have can be really philosophical, you know, because maybe it's how much time you have until you die. You know? <laughs> you never really know. But uh, I think that if you have an idea and you think it's a good idea, taking a lot of time on it is probably going to be in a situation that in two years' time there's probably going to be another competitor doing exactly the same. So you do want to speed it up a little bit in a way. Like if you're going to wait on it, the market is changing all the time. And people are keep on. Okay, so at the end, the longer time you think you have, exactly, the the farther yeah. you can stretch with yeah. investment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why is bootstrapping becoming popular? So you have to understand, we're now very privileged with startups. We have a lot of advantages that five or ten years ago people would only dream of. For example, Dropbox. People five or ten years ago had to. Had to buy servers for I don't know the prices, but crazy prices. Now Dropbox is for free. Skype for doing communication between places. I'm now traveling all over the world in the last four years without Skype. Just thinking about the international calls because I'm most of the day on Skype. It's crazy, and now it's all free. Plugins that allow you to do a lot of the things you have to just install from others and just do your own special thing. All those things are either very cheap or free. Outsourcing uh, platforms like Elance and Odesk that allow you to outsource the work. 
all of those are new. So now it's actually very, very cheap to start a startup and get to a minimum viable product or something that makes sense. This was not the case a few years ago. So uh, this, this one, you probably heard the term. If you're into startups, you, you should know it. So basically it's MVP, minimum viable product, which basically means connects with what I said before about the biggest fail reason for a startup is that nobody would want what you have. And the biggest mistake you can do to yourself is working for years on something, launching it when it's perfect, and then being shocked to see that, wow, nobody really has a problem there, or nobody has a problem they're willing to pay for. So basically the idea now is just launch as soon as you can, even with a few bugs or missing features, and see if there is demand. And be in a situation that people are coming to you and telling you, why don't you have this feature? Why don't you have this feature? And then you know you're in place. That's a really good sign. So instead of being worried about people telling you, that's crazy, why didn't you build this? This is the best sign that you have, that people are coming to you and telling you, that's crazy, this one is missing, why didn't you put it? Uh, because you might have an MVP with not a lot of features, and nobody's going to tell you anything. And then it's a sign that nobody's really interested. So this MVP approach really reduced the prices because people are not building any more complete thing. They're building something very, very um, basic just to test the map. And raising money has huge disadvantages and we're gonna talk about what are the disadvantages now. Uh, it's kind of weird. I have another lecture about how to get money from investors. In the end of the day, I, I got investors for both my businesses. So I, I'm not totally anti-investors, but I'm just saying that there are some reasons about why it doesn't make sense to go to investors. So basically here are the reasons for that, that investment is not that fun. Raising money is a full-time job and the lazier development, it's not an easy thing. Basically it's dedicating days for entire months of running after people. You know, sending them emails, going to calls, going to meetings, preparing presentations, preparing business plans, crazy stuff that takes a lot of your time. And uh, of course, when you go run after those guys, you can't develop your own product, so it's not so amazing. Chances are against you. Uh, there are, I don't know the statistics, but it's about 4% of startups that actually raise major investment. So just know that people with money are not that happy of you know, giving it to, to anyone. You probably know that. So do know that even if you put all this time into the pursuit of investors, you still have chances against you. Maybe it's not. 5%, but it's 20, you know, it's not such a, such a high chance. And if you get an investor, you're no longer your own boss, you have to do a lot of reporting, your decision-making abilities are a little bit uh, not as they used to be uh, before, because you're accountable for others as well. Uh, you're thinking about the others, they, they keep on being in the back of your mind that you have to give them back the money, that you have to create returns for them. If you're a sole entrepreneur, it's not the case anymore. So you lose a little bit of freedom. You can't just go and build the, the visa on whatever you want and you have some agreements with the investor. So freedom is a little bit uh, uh, lost. Uh, they might not be fun to deal with. Uh, basically investors, anyone that has even 2% of the company or 10% of the company has a percent of the company. And as such, uh, they can really get on your nerves and they can be a factor that delays you, that that really makes you feel bad or whatever, it's like a new partner. By the way, there are some investors that are considered smart money, and those guys are great because they bring the money and also help you with consulting and insight and so on, but they might not be the case. In some cases, you can get fired. Uh, some of the very professional investors will ask you to sign a term sheet or a very specific contract that even if they have 20% of the company, they can do a lot of things to actually even kick you out of the company. So especially the professional ones. Uh, one more issue is that investors will always push you towards liquidity. This is something we've discussed, but basically, uh, while you might be happy with a stable cash flow business, that you're, make, hey, you're making $20,000 a month and it's great and everything, and you don't want to take more risk. You're, you're kind of happy and then your investor is telling you, but that was not the deal, that you're happy with $20,000. We're, we're aiming for a lot more and I'm never going to see my investment back. So. Uh, do know that when you take an investor, it's kind of a declaration that you're going really serious and you can't stop. Um, too much money is sometimes distracting, 
uh, which basically is the case that, uh, especially with government funding, by the way, I see it in many places, that basically when you have a lot of money, first of all, you spend it on stupid stuff, you're not bootstrapping anymore, you lose your focus, everything is so easy, and then you run out of the money. Uh, it's, really, it's really easy to spend, it's harder to get back to the mindset of bootstrapping when you start spending a lot. And the second thing is basically that if you have an investor and you have a really product that shouldn't exist, you can work for years because now you have the money to work for years, but after three years you're going to discover that you just wasted a lot of your time, even though you had a lot of money, but it wasn't worthwhile. So there is no real, real reason to, to go for it. Uh, and the last one is that uh, if you delay investment, you're going to get a better valuation. So the more you delay investment and you grow your company, that's where your position in front of investors is better, in a way. A little bit about... Any questions so far? Okay. A little bit about the, the companies I'm doing. This is basically LingoLearn. The beautiful thing about LingoLearn, I know the design is horrible, but it works. I don't know why, but people are signing up, uh, although the design is not good. A landing page and starting to sell. And this is, this is really what's the idea of it here, and it works. Uh, is this a good business? Probably not. The margins are very, very low, a lot lower than what I thought they would be. But this is just an example of a marketing-based business that doesn't have a lot of technology, has a lot of operations. That's a problem, by the way, with Ingolar. It's very hard to scale it. It's very hard to make it big. It's very hard to make money out of it. But still, it's a business that is really easy to set and, and start selling from day one. This is a really interesting business model, not specifically teaching languages or teaching in general, but something that you can sell from the first month, which is great if, if you can manage to do it. Uh, so just a little bit about Lincoln and story. So basically we had no money when we started. So we started with $5,000 of initial investment, which is kind of low if you, if you can start with more. Because I remember we had discussions with my partner about do we want to spend those $10, yes or no. That was our first discussions in the first year. And you don't really want to be there. It's, it's really stalling your development. So we started only with two co-founders. Uh, this is something we talked about, first student in the first month, this one is great. This shows you that, hey, you can get money from the first month, which is cool. Uh, we did take a loan, and let's talk a little bit about the loan phase. You're probably also in a business like LingoLearn, you're going to have to take a loan in the phase that you're scaling it up, okay? So you know it's working, you know you're selling, but then you want to multiply it by five or six. And this is a stage where you have to hire people and you have to keep outsourcing, build processes, build infrastructure, and this stage costs a lot of money. So this is a stage basically that you're probably gonna have to do alone. Uh, it's not gonna be enough to just put 5K and, and keep on growing it because it's gonna be very, very slow. Uh, we did try to get investors in the beginning and investors told us, uh, no, Basically, it's a, it's a lifestyle business. It's not that scalable and so on. They didn't really like it. So I have to admit that we did try to get them. Uh, we just got in our first investor this month, but basically it was because he saw the numbers. And he said, OK, now I'm interested because I see a lot of revenue. Uh, but if we tried to get investors on, on the beginning, it didn't really work. Nobody wanted to talk to us. So you were paying your salaries from 5K? Yeah. Uh, from, it's a, OK, so, so the. The revenue now is 25k a month. No, no, I mean at the beginning. Ah, okay, no, absolutely not. So in the first three years, no salaries. No oh, salaries? No salaries at all. So what were you eating? I'll talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> Basically rice. <laughs> and mushrooms. And uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, so basically we started in the, in, the, in the end of 2010 and we just started breaking even uh, in 2013. And now if the business is a little bit growing and actually allows me to work on the second project uh, in a way. Uh, the conclusion from Ningolar, the only thing that I learned from it is the daily grind that is basically you just show up and you work and you don't think too much. And then you show up and you work and you don't think too much for years. And then just in a certain point of time, you say to yourself, well, now it makes sense. So if I, if I would think every day, is it worth it? I would stop every day. But we just decided that we're going for it until we have no more money. 
And I think this is a really good lesson, this thing about just showing up and working and not thinking that much about what's going to happen unless you see it's a total catastrophe. Uh, and the second, the second advice I have from Nikon is basically partner well. Because we were in a really tough spot that we took a loan and we, we took a loan of about 40,000 no, 30, euros or 35,000 euros and we decided that we're not taking more. So basically we're closing the business the minute we run out of the loan and we were like 2,000 euros before the end and uh, there were crazy situations of months that we lost 5,000 euros without taking salaries. You know, you work, you show up every day, you do your best and you lose 5,000 euros. And the thing that I think kept it going a little bit is that we partnered really well. So if you have a co-founder that you really like, I can't imagine we would continue with Lingonard if we wouldn't get along really well. So this is something that I think those are the major conclusions for me until now from Lingonard. Yeah? Yeah, uh, about that. So do you go more towards like owning a startup on your own completely, like one people, or, or it's better to be in a small team. Yeah, so uh, I never start a startup alone, but that's me. I'm, I'm a person that cannot be alone. That's why I do co-working, I think, by the way. But uh, the thing is that I psychologically don't like to start a startup alone. And by the way, there were a lot of scary things happening in LingoLearn that you know you're one second before going and losing an entire loan and then being in debt all your life. <laughs> That uh, it always helps you to think, hey, he's with me, you know? He's, he's also screwed. Me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, for me, it's really important to, to find a co-founder. But then again, you have to find a really cool one because if you find someone that you don't like, it's, it's like, you know, it's like marriage in a way, finding a co-founder. And if it's not working, you would wish you'd be alone. So for me, it's always finding a co-founder. I suggest you find a good one. And some people, they're really good solo entrepreneurs. I have to say that solo entrepreneurs are usually not achieving that much like people who partner. Like if you really have high ambitions, a loan is not going to work. By the way, investors do not usually talk to solo entrepreneurs. They simply don't, don't like to talk to people who... For them it's like validation that nobody wants to team up with you and they know that there is a limit to how much you can do alone. So know that if you're alone, it's not really for investors. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the business is not going to grow as fast in comparison to starting with someone. Yeah, so this is the second business that uh, started. It's called Startup Link, a very technological business. Over here, there is a huge vision. LingoLearn is basically selling packages of languages, <coughs> like all the time trying to increase revenue. We have usually one market. Basically, we're very strong in Israel, in my country. And uh, basically, this one is a global map documenting and, comment and, and connecting the startup ecosystem. This one is actually going nicely. We got a few very small investors. Uh, last month, we had a lot of traffic. We got featured in about 50 magazines like The Next Web and Forbes and, and Product Hunt and, and places like that. So we had about 1,500 startups registering on the map. That was, that was actually pretty cool. Uh, and that's again another type of business. So again, I, I, I said it in the beginning, you have to figure out what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do this, don't try to do it alone. And I have to tell you that I'm happy that I'm trying to do this after I'm trying to do LingoLearn because you get a lot of experience for something that has a smaller vision that when you go on the big fish, then you feel like, okay, at least I know a little bit and it's not that. So a little bit about Startup Link. So we started as four co-founders, now we're two. Uh, two. Two put on us in the beginning of the project. And by the way, again, this is something that's going to happen. If you're going to partner with co-founders, do know, from my experience, 50% are going to quit on you, sadly. That's, that's a statistic. It's not because they're bad, but because they're going to think about, hey, does, that doesn't make sense. And no startup makes sense in the beginning. You're always, if you're thinking about it for a second, the risk you're taking, the time you're losing, the money you're losing, you're always, if you think about it really hard, you're going to say, I quit. And that's what happens to a lot of people. Your best friends are going to quit on you, and that's okay. And by the way, that, uh, my co-founder now, Roderick, uh, I met him on Elance. He was my boss on a business plan uh, uh, project. 
uh, when I was in Paraguay, actually living in Paraguay. And I'm just saying that because, uh, first of all, we're kind of a virtual partnership. We met about four times until now, so it's kind of nice. And the second thing I would like to say about this is basically, I did a business plan for him three years ago, and I knew that we got along nicely. Although I never saw him, he was in, in Switzerland, I was in, in uh, Paraguay. I knew that this is a person I can get along with because we were preparing the business plan for three months. And it was a really nice interaction and he never disappeared. And then what I did, because I know how hard it is to find a co-founder, I said, okay, I'm keeping in touch with this guy. And this is maybe a lesson I have for you. If you find this person that you're saying, hey, this is a really cool person. I hope that one day I might have an opportunity to start a business with him. Stay in touch, you know, and then when the opportunity comes, then you get a call and, and maybe they join. So there is a lot of investment in relationships here as well. And Can you elaborate a little bit more, that fact that it's virtual and then you actually, that you met virtually and that you matched yeah. uh, virtually? Because I believe, I don't know about the others, but uh, I believe it's quite common that the people need the physical interaction. Yeah. Uh, at least to find out the chemistry and, and how they could work with each other. I, I agree. The physical chemistry is really important to, to meet people and know that they're... But you know, I, I do business plans and basically it looks like this. I have, I had, now I don't do it anymore, but I had a few types of clients. Those that disappear in the middle, that those are the types you like the most because they pay you and then you never hear from them because they understand they don't really want to do the business and so on. So the disappearing type, the boss types, like why didn't you do that, why didn't you do that, and the people like Roderick that you really get along with, like, the, you know, interaction, Skype interaction for three months every day or every two days, never disappearing, always treating you well, and then you say to yourself, oh, this is a cool guy. So I have to tell you, you can kind of understand who is the person also if you have a lot of interaction. By the way, I'll tell you a small thing about Israel. Israel has a very successful startup scene. And uh, when people are trying to figure out why, uh, one of the most common uh, reasons, and I actually believe in this reason, is the army. And basically what happens in the army in Israel is that you spend three years with a lot of people. And in very stressful situations sometimes. For example, my, my co-founder in Lingolern, that did, never quit on me, we were together in the army for four years. So what I want to say is that basically, the army allows you a filtering mechanism. It's not that the people are better. You just know after three years with a lot of people who are the ones you're never going to start a business with. And for most people in other countries, it's more difficult because you don't have that much interaction. So you have to kind of take a, take a bet, like a first date, you know, or a second date. That you're saying, this person is amazing and you're probably not going to end up marrying them. And that's what the army allows in Israel to really figure out who is the person. Do I, do I really want to uh, open a company with them and go into this deep relationship or not? Um, Start with one of the things that we had is that we didn't find a CTO, so we have no coder. And that means, again, you need an investor. And this is a nice example about even if you don't have a CTO and if you have a technological business, you want a CTO, that you can still make it. Uh, a little bit about uh, what we did. So basically, we raised 30,000 investment from friends, uh, which is a really good source of money. By the way, friends, I used to be really against it, but now I understand that this is basically the only source that really exists. And we put 15,000 of our own. Uh, we hire extensively in Odesk and Elans to reduce costs. We actually have someone in, in the Czech Republic, in Prague, that is helping us out. And, um, the conclusion, again, for Startup Link is that you can't do this kind of project on your own. You need some backing, some money from other people if you're going that big, so technological and so on. So, so how did you initiate that, initiated that, or open that idea on the Elands, like, guys, let's do that? What do you mean? Well, uh, I saw some websites like Elands and so on, and I saw that, or, or Matching founder or for finding founder. Ah, founder the, the story, the story. Like so many, like, uh, I have this idea, I'm yeah. looking for a CTO, blah, blah, blah. You know, and what, I, I, don't, I don't believe in those sites. Like, I really don't believe in those sites. Basically, my story about Elance was about doing a job for someone, a business plan, and then two years ah. after. So you got that experience through that? Yeah, I experienced a okay. lot of time with them. I don't like the matching site because, again, they don't give you enough information about the person. 
and if you are co-founding with someone, try to have as much information as you can about the person, including what happened in bad moments, like when there was pressure and stuff. That's where you actually want to know how is the connection like. Um, it's like couples, that don't have, a lot of them break, uh, break in, in when they travel, you know, because then it's a little bit more intensive. So it's the same here. You've got to figure out that the points of pressure are the points where a team is actually collapsing. And you want to uh, have a few of those. And why did you mention on the previous slide that you should have had the CTO? Uh, because it's a very technological business and if I had a CTO, I would not spend as much. We spent until now on the platform about $50,000 okay. on coding mostly because we don't do marketing. All the PR we got is basically organic. So if you know that you need a lot of development, it's better to have a CTO. I'm just saying, if you don't, get money. Money is a plug number that kind of solves everything, you know, in a way. You don't have a CTO. If you have money, you're going to buy a CTO. But then again, bootstrapping is all about, okay, you don't have money. And if you don't have money and you know that you're building something technological, you need a CTO. Uh, let's talk a little bit about bootstrapping sources. So there are a few sources for bootstrapping and we're going to go over them one by one. This is a list. Go over that. So basically the first one, oh, but before we do that, those are, uh, this is a, for me it was really eye-opening chart. And basically what you see here are the sources of how do people fund their startups. And basically what you see over here is that those things are cut, but basically this is VC, professional, angels, and everything. This is really small amount. And you see this one and this one, which is basically most of the people who build their startup are actually funding it by their private savings. And this is the truth. Everyone is talking investors and VCs and blah, 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 blah. This is how it looks like. And you can see the huge amount of money going actually from people's pockets and credits and whatever and the only source that actually really works on investment but this is for another lecture is basically family and friends those are the guys who are really funding business all over the world it's not the VCs and it's not the angels they're doing very few job a few uh, few uh, 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 like uh, deals the, 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 the professional ones family and friends are really strong in anything so this is the biggest source maybe of investment there is a little bit about self-funding. Uh, so self-funding is actually pretty cool. Uh, it's not bad. A lot of people are like, whoa, I'm doing a startup. No way I'm going to fund it myself. But yeah, fund it yourself. And there are some good reasons for funding it a little bit yourself. At least $5,000, $10,000. Because, first of all, it creates the self-commitment. You're going to see that it's a lot harder for you to quit if you actually spend money on something. People call it skin in the game. So if you have skin in the game, uh, you're going to see that it's going to help you to stick with the project. The second thing is that it signals your commitment to co-founders and investors. If you're trying to get co-founders and you try to get investors and you didn't invest a lot in your startup, they will say, whoa, but you're not taking a risk on it. Why should I help you out and team with you or invest in you? So skin in the game is really important, including not taking salaries and so on. And it allows you to start right now. Because basically it's your money and you have it and you just start rolling with it. A little bit more about self-funding. So basically this connects to your question about what did I eat. So basically what I, what I believe, I saw a few ways of doing this. The first one is very common. Some jobs allow you to work while building your own MVP at the same time. So you have this, those jobs, for example, salesperson, if you have to be on the phone all the time and there is no time to do anything else, a lot of people are only working about two or three hours, actually out of, out of eight, eight hours. They're waiting for a case to happen, uh, there is nothing to do, and those people can build a startup. So if you're into startups, you probably, and you have to have a job yet because you, you need the oxygen, you need the money, try finding a job that will allow you to at least spend two hours a day or three hours a day while working on your startup. And this is a really good position, there aren't that many jobs like that, but there are. So if you try to find those, you're going to find one like this. Maybe it's going to pay a little bit less, but it's good. Now, what I did basically, or what, how I found myself is freelancing. So I decided that um, in the beginning, half of my day is going to go on freelancing, and half of my day is going to go on startups. And that's basically what I did. So yeah, you lose a lot of focus, but then again, 
That's the only way I could have done it. So, um, yeah, so, so freelancing is really, really good, and, uh, and I recommend, I do recommend doing freelancing, or, or I do recommend have an oxygen channel that brings you cash while working on your startup. I don't recommend doing full-time startup and trying to fund it, and then you're under pressure because you have exactly six months and so on, and you actually need two years or whatever. So what I, what I did is basically always have on the side a channel that allows me to make money while building my startup. Uh, if you want to start, two really good sources are Elance and Odesk. Those are the biggest ones. I think they're now together in a way. Everything is there. I tried with others like Guru and Freelancer.com. Never worked out for me. So those are the ones I use now to hire everyone, everyone that I hire. Uh, so yeah, the, to repeat it again, you do need an oxygen channel. Don't go full speed on the start. Yeah. Just um, what's wrong with freelancer.com? Why, why do you prefer this tool about freelancer.com? Yeah. So basically, in freelancer.com, I never managed to get a job there. Now, I don't know if it's because I was in financial services or whatever, but it felt to me like the prices were super low. And by the way, I'm not looking for that also when I'm hiring. When I'm hiring, I'm looking for a combination of quality and low price. So I think I would go for Elance and Odesk, but depends. Maybe on design and stuff, you can find other platforms that are better. But this is basically my experience. I tried all of them, although only those two work on hiring and freelancing. So, yes. So this is, by the way, how uh, how what you do on freelance when you freelance, no matter in which platform, it can be Guru, freelance, or freelance. All this, you build a mega profile, you will try to impress, and you try getting jobs. And basically, again, try getting jobs on something you do well. Try to get a really good hourly of around twenty dollars, thirty dollars, if you're a developer, even more, and use the money to shift it to the startup. The startup is not going to make you money. The startup is only going to dry you out of money. A little bit about loans and credit. Um, loans are kind of tricky, but sometimes they're needed. Like I said, in Lebanon, we took a 35,000 uh, 35, euro loan. Uh, the only thing I would say is uh, about loans is the following. First of all, about loans, if you're not sure the demands exist, don't get loan. So only get loan after you sold. Okay, you validated that there is demand and now you're in a stage that you have to scale and that's a good stage to take a loan. But if you're like, oh, I'm not sure anyone would ever buy this, chances are they're not going to buy it. The statistics are saying that they're not going to buy it 90%. I wouldn't take a loan in this situation. Loans are for scaling. They're not for testing. Now, even uh, one of the, this, the second thing you have to remember about the loan is look at it as some cost, like you lost it and then tell yourself, how severely would my life quality change if I lose this money that I took as a loan? Think that you're going to have to repay the loan and it's over. If it's very severe, don't take the loan. Like if you don't really have this money. And what we did in Lingonan that I think was very helpful because you can really get addicted to loans, you know, because the banks are always going to offer you another one and another one until you're totally dead and then they're going to stop. So it's basically cap your loss. So what we did in Lingonan, which I think was very smart, is to take this 35,000 euro loan and say, no matter what happens, if we're out of money, that's it. We're closing the business. Because it would have been really easy for us to say, hey, let's just continue. Let's take 10 more and 20 more, and then you're in a situation that you're like under for the rest of your lives. Yeah, a few words about if you are going for this loan option, so something really, really quick. Basically, the, the biggest advantage about the loan, and this is a really fun thing about loan, is that you have the money in your account in one second, which is pretty cool. Investors are really tough, and it takes a long time. Loans are really, really fast. If you're going to the bank, become prepared. They wouldn't care that much. They want to give credit, but some of them will ask you for a business plan and actually go a little bit deeper. Uh, so you have to come with something that makes sense. Shop around, banks are like marketplaces, really, they look respectable, they're not, so if you go from place to place, you're going to see that you get better deals on the interest rate, and look for specific loans, we took a student loan, there are SBA loans, all types of loans, so this is really helpful, because loans for startups are with very high interest, because startups are risky, 
if you can go into another program of Alon, that, that's better. Can you compare the countries in that sense? Uh, yeah, developed countries are a lot easier to get loans than developing countries. Uh, so basically, I don't know the situation here, but let's say I gave this uh, lecture in Greece two months ago, and when I was in the loan slide, someone told me, can you skip? Because we don't give loans here. Nobody's getting loans in Greece. The so same basically. here. Huh? The, the same, same here. here. Yeah. So I skipped to grants. <laughs> <laughs> I did this very quickly. But again, I think loans are okay, but scale it. Use it to scale. And by the way, the, the bank, when it sees that you have revenue, they're more into giving loans because when you show them that money is coming in the account, you have more chances than just showing up with them. But be careful with loans. Uh, grants. I don't know a lot about grants. I never got a grant, but basically you can get it from the government, the EU. I know the EU is going crazy on, on grants and stuff like that, so this is a channel that you want to check. Those guys are giving a lot of money, you want to check this cha channel. Uh, the good thing is that they, it doesn't require equity, so that's pretty cool. They, they just give you the grant. The, thing is, the best thing is that it takes a lot of time, a lot of bureaucracy. It's going to take a lot of your time, so only if you feel like going through the process that, uh, that's there. And check the, the small letters in grants, because sometimes you're going to see that, for example, uh, if you take this grant, you have to employ 50% of the people in the Czech Republic, and you might not be willing to do it, or it might really stall your, your growth, so check and see that the terms are, are in your favor. Now, a little bit about crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, I don't really understand. We did start a link crowdfunding campaign two months ago just as a test. We've actually got five, $500. So for us, it was like, wow, you're actually giving us money. Like, you get uh, notices of people giving you $150 out of the blue. So it's pretty cool. It's actually working if you know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. But uh, I'm going to try again. But I, I think I learned a lot. So basically, it's creating viral campaigns and getting funded by the public, and lots of advantages. Basically, you don't have to give equity, you don't have to have a business plan. Uh, it makes you think about what you're doing. I did a crowdfunding campaign, and then I was like talking to my co-founder and saying, what are we really doing? That's the first time that you actually think about, okay, well, does it make sense? How do I present it to people? Uh, no due diligence, no one is checking you. You can offer whatever you want. If it makes sense, people will buy it. And uh, it, it allows you also to validate demand, which is really cool. For example, if someone is giving $150 for nothing, then basically you have something. Because they're saying, wow, what an exciting story. And that's a really good signal for you that you're onto something. So it's really good for validation. If you're doing a crowdfunding campaign and nobody cares, then maybe nobody cares. And maybe nobody will buy the product anyway. Uh, disadvantages, it takes time and money, so it's not really that easy to do a crowdfunding campaign and you might uh, promise perks that you will never be able to supply, but then again, you know. Now, this is the one I like the, the most. This is basically saying make your push to market or make your, your clients your investors. So, this is the best. If you can make your clients your investors, it's the best situation. Because they are, in a way. Who are your investors? Your clients. So how to get there, basically work with Lean start startup methodology and get feedback and just think about how do I get to the market all the time? How do I get to the market? How do I sell something really, really fast? Um, and th that's the second bullet what's talking about like generating money as soon as possible. Uh, you work Pareto and basically it means you're putting the 20% of your time on the 80% where the value is and that's always the case. There is always 20% of gold that if you put your time and efforts there, it's going to give you the highest return. So that's, that's how you push to the market, you just focus on those 20%. Uh, a lot of people are doing actually, they're building what others have with small tweaks. So basically you see a model that is working, you're changing something very, very small, and you start selling it. And that's what a lot of people are doing very successfully. And then you don't have to spend months or years on development. It's already ready, you just did your own thing to change it a little bit. Find a story, something that makes buzz. For example, uh, I'm a digital nomad, so I use this. This thing about traveling, I have lectures about being a digital nomad. Why do I do that? First of all, I like to talk about it. It's a nice story. Second of all, uh, you're going to see that if you don't have a story, you're going to have to pay Google and Facebook to publish your story on the Google Ads and Facebook Ads. So you need some kind of an element of, hey, we're special, I'm special, we're special because. 
whatever he calls it. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this was really important. Don't be shy. Like hustle, like all the time. Send emails. Hey, I want to do this. What about this? And do you think about this? And I want to do a cooperation about this. And not something empty, like, uh, hey, let's do something together. Be creative. Think about how you can create value, how you can create uh, partnerships, and go for it. So that's, that's basically the push to the market. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the team, because this is the biggest article of expense. So basically on the team, salaries are your biggest expense. It's always the case, especially in a technological uh, uh, startup that does not have, we don't have inventory anymore, most of us. And everything is expensive on salary. Technology is pretty cheap. So basically, uh, what I recommend you to do is the following. Since you're the first team member, try building something that aligns with your skills. Let's say you're a great mathematician. How do I say it? Mathematician. Mathematician. You want to do something probably with math. You know, because you're there, you have the skills, you have the expertise, you can save a lot of money doing something special that not a lot of people can do. Connect to your core skills and expertise. Don't say, I always had a dream to be a musician, so I'm going to do a music startup if you don't know nothing about music. You know, although it might really be your passion, but then again, it's not, it's not a good use of resources when you bootstrap. Find team members who do what you can't do and, and save substantial costs. For example, in Startup Link, it would have been great to have a developer. Again, we knew that most of the money will go on development. We tried to get a developer and nobody wanted to join us. But then again, at least try to find the team members that you know are going to save you a lot of money. LingoLearn, for example, is a marketing business. Most of the money is going on marketing and sales. Nothing is going on development in LingoLearn. And that's where you need the people who know marketing and sales. So try to figure out what does the startup need and find it, the co-founders that are relevant for this startup. Uh, put time into writing good partnership agreements that cover issues such as vesting, future equity events, and more. Uh, as I told you before, 50% of your startup co-founders will quit on you. You want some kind of an agreement that says, okay, what happens if you quit? Don't take it for granted, even if they're good friends. The Italians have a saying, uh, clear agreement, good friendship. I heard this from an Italian, but I don't know how to say it in, Ita in, uh, in Italian. But basically, this is really important. Don't say, he's my best friend, he's never going to disappoint me. Have an agreement written. Even if you don't have a company, have something written. One page, not something big. But to make clear of what happens under which circumstances. In Italian, it's not and it's a room. Ah, wow, that's great. I have to record it and then I just play it on memory. <laughs> Good stuff. And this is, we're getting closer to the end. So basically, one of the things that you want to work on as a bootstrapper is basically on your networking. So there is a saying that basically, what you build multiplied by how strong is your network is basically the result that you're going to have. Okay? So basically, if you build something amazing and you can't communicate it to anyone because you have no network, the result is not going to be amazing. If you're the best networking in the world and you're now connected to Richard Branson and Bill Gates and whatever, but you have no, nothing to, actually no product, also, nothing's going to come out of it. So it's a combination of those both. And the, your network is really boosting the result. So what I would do on the network is first of all do exactly what you're doing. Go to meetings, to meetups. It seems like I'm the most important part in this meetup. That's not true. Uh, the most important part is actually you talking to other people in the meetup, getting to know your future co-founders, clients, and so on. Uh, educate yourself with blogs this is something that I do. Seth Godin and so on. Get some mentors. Try to connect with some people that you can send an email and ask for advice. I did this and it works. Go to meetups. Talked about it. Mastermind groups. That's a new concept that I'm trying to do. And uh, pitch and lecture, exactly what I'm doing. You know, try to get get out there, talk about your ideas. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So basically, maybe some final tips uh, on reducing cost. One thing that is not written over here is what I said before, and I think it's the most important thing. It's the daily grind. It's basically showing up every day, working, 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 never stopping, and not thinking about his profile. Never, like, on startups you don't do that, you just, Seth Godin has a nice book called The Deep, he's basically talking about if you do a startup, just take a dip, like say, oh, I'm not thinking anymore, I'm, until I run out of money or two years are past, I'm not thinking about anything, I just go for it. 
Uh, go live somewhere cheap. This is something that I do. Israel is very, very expensive, and in the, those four years I lived in really, really cheap places that allowed me, like Bosnia and India and so on, uh, that allowed me to actually work on my startups without a lot of pressure. Prague is a really good place, by the way. It's, it's good value. Um, say bye to your ego. So basically, if you have an ego, it's not good to do a startup with an ego because the first years are going to be so difficult, and you're going to have to cut up back on so many things that. If you're really, if it's important for you to show what a success story you are, then basically the startup uh, path is not really for you. And use freelancing some platforms. Mm -hmm. Some specific example of what you mean by by ego. Yeah, let's say uh, you know you started the startup and then you used to go with your friends uh, every week, twice a, twice a week to a restaurant. You know when you had your daily job, and then. Yeah, to be in a position that you tell them, no, I'm not doing that anymore, I don't have the money for it. And yeah, just think about how to cut expenses in a way. And the last one is use freelancing platforms to hire and work. Again, the world is global now. You can work for rich clients. You can hire people who charge very few amounts of dollars an hour. And then it's good to use all the resources that you have around you, not, not only what you have over here. And that's pretty much it. So uh, this is my email. If anyone wants to stay in touch, um, ask me some questions, startuplink.com. If you have a startup or an idea, it would be great if you can sign, sign it up over there. And uh, thank you very much for showing. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can, yeah. Uh, first of all, what's the difference between a uh, startup and an online business? Nobody knows. No, <laughs> start, start up, there are like 50, 50 definitions of startups. What I look at it as some kind of a change agent. Something that does something with some ingredient of innovation is a startup. Uh, an online business is something that... Look, Lingonan is also a startup because we took something that worked in another market in the US and we brought it to Israel. So in a way there was a, an innovation there. But the startup might be even more technological, not a, not a business, cash flow operating business, not a lifestyle design business, not, not, but something that goes a little bit bigger, that can grow really, really fast and is very scalable. So, yeah. You can ask the investors, they have a very different definition also. Yeah. But either you build a small business and when you want to build a startup, it needs to have a growth of 7% month on month. At least. The, the quick, the, how quick you grow this? this that's, that's, that's why Combinator's uh, definition is how Paul Graham is saying that the startup is anything that can grow really, really fast. Mm -hmm. I connect a little bit more to the notion that the startup is anything that brings an ingredient of innovation, some kind of innovation. Mm -hmm. But then again, for me, it doesn't really important the definition. What is important for me is to understand do I need an investor or not? Mm -hmm. Basically. So when you open another bakery or pub, it's not a startup? Exactly, yeah. Oh, okay. Unless you serve beer that tastes like melons or something. You know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I had this in Serbia, they have watermelon beer. So I said, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I'd like to ask, what's the value of startup bring for startups? And what is the main source of income? Yeah, so starting the company does not generate any income. Uh, why they signed up? Because everyone wants to see themselves on the map. Uh, how we think we're going to make money from the data. There is a lot of data there that people are interested in. And there are some companies that we're now talking with that actually want to build their own startup map. So basically it's going to be embedding technologies to, to other sites. Like white labeling. Hmm? Like white labeling or something. Yeah, some kind of white labeling. Chances of success, not that high. I know that. You know, it's like, uh, but you know, it just keep on going. All for the best. Uh, about your, your first business, uh, do you still spend a lot of time on it or do you uh, automatize it and does it basically make money alone? Uh, yeah, that so, people, uh, yeah that's, what I, uh, that's what I did. Most of my day now is going to start up Link and LingoLearn keeps on growing because I have a co-founder that is now very much into operations. Basically I work on a subsidy model. LingoLearn was losing money. The freelancing was subsidizing LingoLearn. Startup Link is losing money, LingoLearn is subsidizing Startup Link. So basically I always have something that's subsidizing a losing operation. 
That's why I'm poor. You know? That's why I'm poor. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Can, you, can you share more about the, when you were living in, in low-cost places and, and maybe relatedly the psychological ups and downs that you yeah. made reference to? So yeah, I, I basically decided that I want to see the world. It doesn't make sense for me to stay in one place. And since I decided that, for maybe I'll do a lecture about this because this is already like the nomadic lifestyle lecture. But basically, for me, I really enjoyed traveling when I was a lot younger. And I said to myself, okay, how do I go back to something that resembles this period the most? And this it wasn't. It wasn't primarily out of necessity. Absolutely not. Really no. I have to say that, that this this make some impact financially as well. It was very hard for me to get investors because they looked at me and said, wow, you're traveling, you're not really working, and uh, you lose a lot of time on information, everything is new, so no, it doesn't do really good. There are some good elements to it, for example, the low cost that you can narrate, but on total, it's kind of reducing your financial situation. Okay, and then the, the psychological side, you said that it's not for uh, people who would be, get over, overly focused on the down part. Yeah. Uh, can you give an example of just like down part? Of, of traveling or a startups? No, uh, startups. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, one month ago we got a letter from a lawyer in Lingoland that we breached some kind of an IP whatever and they're su they want to sue us for 20,000 euros that we, no, they want to sue us if we don't pay them 20,000 euros at the, at, the, at the exact moment, you know? And then you have a crazy month of amazing revenue, breaking revenue, and then you have a crazy month of really, really low revenue that you don't really know where it came from, and then your best employees is quitting on you, and then you find someone even better, so on. That's the side as a startup. So if you're going to be manic depressive of, yeah, we did it, and oh my god, we're, we're dead, then it's not fun. <laughs> you yeah, so, so you have a lawyer? Uh, we, in, in Lincoln, yeah, we have a lawyer, because it's a lot of clients already. So yeah, you want to build some kind of a legal infrastructure if you deal a lot with clients and you know that you're starting to sell. Yeah. But if you're not, no need. You can postpone. Even even starting a company and all this, you can postpone for later until you see you have some sales and it makes sense. Because there's no sense in starting a company, Delaware, LLC, and then nobody's interested and you close it. There's no real reason. So Do you I also see. find the lawyers on the Elons? No, no. Lawyers and accountants, I like to have it all. It's like the guys that you kind of trust, that you need them when things go wrong. So, yeah. When you are traveling, how do you deal with the accountants? Uh, easy. Excel sheets and sending all the invoices to an accountant. It's not really something you can... So you use local accounts, uh, uh, local accountants for yeah. those? Depends where the company is. For example, the legal learning is in Israel, so yeah, the accountant has to be in Israel. Yeah. But the accountants, this solves itself out. In the end of the day, you know, the bureaucracy and the small things, you figure them out. Nobody really cares of, about you. We think that the tax authorities are after us and everything. They don't really care when you're that small. So you can figure it out on the move as long as you do it well. And it shouldn't be a reason of stopping you from doing something. You know, because a lot of people are really freaked out by the bureaucracy and taxes and everything. And it's not really a reason to delay yourself. We, we did, had the same problem. We delayed ourselves because of accounting. And we noticed in the end that uh, you're trying to think about, but if I make this amount of money in the first year, maybe I should, and then you lose money for three years, so it doesn't really <laughs> matter. So all those calculations, they don't make sense anyway. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really important question for me. Uh, how do you confirm the man? How do you confirm the man? I think in the end of the day, it's people buying from you. So or, yeah, so uh, should you already stay? Should you know, okay, well, there is, there is a room because I heard about you know making a Google ad campaign without having your product finished, but just more through analytics, more than four clicks, a buy, and then you know, sorry, the, we don't have the product yet, but we can find Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what are also techniques that, that could be used to Exactly the one you said. Uh, I'll give you a story in Lingoland, for example. We started with teaching English, that's what our first campus. 
And I have a university friend that always told me, why don't you teach Spanish? Because he wanted to go to Mexico. And he was like, wow, I want English, I want to learn Spanish. Then I went to my co-founder and told him, look, it's time for us to expand. And I have, a, I have a first client in Spanish. We have to open the Spanish campus. We opened the Spanish campus. I'm running after this guy in the last four years. Now it's a joke. Like, give me your credit card. No. And the thing <laughs> is that a lot of people are going to tell you, great idea, great idea, great idea. Never going to pay you. So if you want to know how to confirm demand, get money. For, for what you said, that looking at that a lot of companies doing it and a lot of market. That's good. That's, yeah, really good. that's what you said. Yeah. I, I, I didn't think about it. That's, that's really good. Yeah. Uh, and also what you said about the, the, the crowdfunding. Because now I, I get like requests for uh, paying for crowdfunding every day and kind of it's full yeah. of crowdfunding. But that's really a great way to see if people want the product. Exactly, yeah. Try to yeah give the perks as the product, as the future product, and see if someone is interested. I wouldn't say it's the first thing I would do. Yeah, it's market research, first of all, trying to sell yourself the best thing. Crowdfunding, only something to get a better feeling and maybe some extra cash, but not more than that. Cool, so thank you very much for arriving. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. I said no, it was recording because it was just a black. Yes, yes, I hope it did. <laughs> Let's check. Uh, I guess it did because then when you moved that, uh, I yeah. could see the.